Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here this start of a new campaign in Tiano, the last years of Europe, in which we're playing as the United Kingdom. But it is September 3rd, 1962, and we're going on the path to get Andrew Fountaine. Now, I've read about the Watchmen before. If you'd like to read about the Watchmen, please go right ahead. But right now, we're going to go with whatever will increase the popularity or the power of the ideologues. So as you can see, I've already played this a little bit. And so we need more ideologues here. And side with Andrew Fountaine, which would be a fantastic thing for us. And we're going to go with a firm grip. For 20 years, the BPP has toiled to create a Britain with the modern age, for the modern age. A Britain able to withstand the forces that once brought down the wartime government, the devils of liberalism and <clears throat> Judeo-Bolshevism. Though these demons still infest our nation, the BPP is now set to finally slay these beasts for good and follow Germany fully into the new order. Yet, even with their achievements, there is an increasingly increasing growth in cowards and snakes within the, the party who argue that we should be more conciliatory, more open to those not accepting of the new order. Nonsense. The new order is upon us, and it would be a fool's errand to seek to run from this. Know the future of our party lies in Fountain and the ideologues and the tight grip of our uh, F-word ideology. Of course. Of course. As you can see, I've already balanced it out so that, for the most part, the ideologues are winning in every category, maybe except for the peers, as well as the German garrison, but it is what it is. We have a yearly surplus, a decent amount of growth, debt to GDP ratio is doing okay, and inflation is, well, honestly, kind of high. Um, we're at 25% chaos, and I do plan on doing the uh, Gerard Walla paths as well eventually, and the, his path is the last path so far at the time of this recording that actually has content. The other collaborationists do not have uh, content yet, or they might be just be fail-safes. So, unfortunately, that is what it is. Ooh, that's not good enough, no. Uh, let's see, ideologues, lose a little bit more political power, uh, chaos goes up, it is what it is, expand their interests, and a firm grip of course as well. And all the speaker, uh, in the great game of British politics, someone, sometimes one only needs a stage and a microphone to radically change their political climate. Thus with the BPP conference coming up, the opportunity to give the opening speech of the conference a chance to set the agenda for the BPP for the future's highly envied and sought after position. For this position, there are two clear candidates for the speech, Rob Butler and Andrew Fountaine. Both desire this position for a chance to showcase the superiority of their position, yet only one will have the opportunity to make their mark on the Brit party and with it, Britain itself. So, we're going to go with whatever gives us more uh, ideologue support. Our God-given rights, which increases the private support or influence in the party, or among the dark satanic mills, which I accidentally did when I did um, the Rob Butler path. So, this does improve the ideologue, so we have to do this one. This is not a time for restraint or a compromise. A country size is being torn apart by the German corporations, and nothing but quick, decisive action will stop it. For that reason, we must propose that the Prime Minister immediately begin restricting and displacing German industry from the countryside, taking a direct approach against it. While convincing it will be a great task due to a government requiring backing from these very same corporations, it must be done. Ultimately, while the profiteering corporations may well be outraged, the German government itself may be convinced of the righteousness of our cause, and allow these measures to be passed with the same spirit that led to the repeal of the Parliament Act. Hey, 3% growth, not bad, less or plus. Inflation is going down. Nice. Also, with the workshop of the world, since we can't even complete anyways, at this point, I just took away all of the um, production units from it. And threw a lot of all the extra production units onto the civvies. We also have no navy, because why would we need a navy? A close call. Uh, let's see. I think I read this one before, so if you worry about this one, please go right ahead. Yeah. Made in Germany, a retrenched conviction. Some of the more foolhardy amongst ourselves have forgotten who the greatest allies are. We do not stand as a single title, and so we stand as exemplars of the modern world, together as part of the great European community. Therefore, we will affirm the place of honor that Germany holds within our country. After all, they're the ones who liberated us from the tyranny of the past. Nice. And we still got to play as Ukraine. Oh, God. Among the brown winter fog. <clears throat> Jude Shaw. Pace out walkways at the industrial industrial tannery with its owner, Stefan Brunk, trailing behind him. The workplace inspector arrived without notice, emerging on this Friday morning with no notice whatsoever. A snap inspection, one that had uh, arrived much sooner than expected, yet Brunk found the inspector's attitude to be perplexing. He walked around with a clipboard in hand, but he wrote nothing down. They walked along a catwalk with wobbling rails. Workers attended to their station with missing fingers. Only half of the employees here had proper protective equipment. Even as he was confronted by numerous workplace safety violations that would make informant in Guangdong blush, Shaw did not mark his form. Of course, thought Brunk. This was just a fundraising drive. By the time they returned to the entrance, Brunk knew, wore a knowing smile. Thank you for your time, Inspector, said Brunk in a harsh continental accent. He held out an envelope with a smile. I trust that you found everything satisfactory. 
Shaw wiped his clipboard against the envelope, flicking it away from his fingers. The council was very displeased to see the level of irresponsible management in this factory. Brunk's jaw hung open. Soil samples taken from the air, air surrounding this property showed an unacceptably high level of chromium. I have been burying waste illegally, he sighed. No matter, this factory is being shut down. Effective immediately until the waste has been removed. As Shaw walked back to the factory to shut it all down, Brunk slid into the side door, raced up his office, and immediately called, placed a call to the Royal Mail, demanding an urgent telegram be sent to his employers in Germany. English government shut down the factory without cause. Urgent assistance as required. Nay, shall my sword sleep in my hand? The House of Lords is an ancient and venerable institution. One's approval is volatile for any government to gain due uh, due their restored legislative powers, unfortunately. The Lords seem to be slipping further and further away from us, with the real danger emerging that they may actually reject some of our bills or even wave through those we wish to see defeated. This is utterly unacceptable. The solution to this problem is clear. We need more peers in the BPP. Our old guard corps remains a dominant bloc. But to secure that position, we must cut susceptible cross benchers and continue to spread the wisdom of British fascism within the peerage. After all, the opera house is a sword to be wielded by we righteous men against a nefarious agenda of dissenters within the ranks in the open op opposition alike. And in times like these, the blade of the old guard must be kept sharp indeed. More fascism popularity, more stability, always good. Very, uh, very decent. And happy November, everybody. Happy November. Eight days left, and what else we got here? Ideologues, I don't want to decrease growth. Ooh, this is really hot, though. Hmm. Do both of them. That's fine for now. We have a lot of influence in the party. She's not the German corporations. We shall leave. Ah, yes, the opening speech of the annual BPP conference. Arguably one of the defining moments of the conference, it is a grandiose and rousing call to action made by the enraptured military membership every year. Due to the significance of the event, the position of speaker is an enviable one indeed. It leaves the speaker with a great deal of pers both personal prestige and political capital afterwards. This year, the two main contenders for the position are the two strongmen of party politics, Rev Butler of the pr Pragmatist Faction and Andrew Fontaine of the Ideologues. Whichever the two uh, makes a speech, their respective faction will surely be empowered. Who shall be? Fontaine should surely web up. The crowd. Not good here, and that's good here at least. It's not good here though. Oh, we might hit 40. Fear and loathing cloud every movement. Well, no oh well. The sleeper awakes. <clears throat> My bad, I should have washed that a little closer, but you know, we're not above 60%, so it doesn't really matter. Oh. Still pretty high, so let's try to lower it even more. Happy December, everybody. Oh, credit rating improved too. Look at that. Nice, nice, nice. Very good, very good. What to do with Wilson? With the death of the old British, uh, Burton amongst the blood of Sea Lion. Burton was reborn near the rebirth, so followed some remnants of the old order who remained. Oopsie. Um, who remained? Devoted to the service of Britannia, willing to aid us in rebuilding Brunson once more. Among these individuals, there is one man who stands out, the one man who is seen as a snake by even the pragmatist Harold Wilson. He, Wilson, since the end of World War II, has rapidly risen through our government, fulfilling each job assigned to him with extreme competence, yet unlike so many of his contemporaries. Wilson's motives remain a mystery even to this day, but are himself viewing him with mistrust. With the BPP conference coming up, we shall have to decide whether to aid in his rise or crush the snake under our heel. Shining forth upon our clouded hills. With the new members of Ongar ranks, the majority in the House of Lords is assured, ensuring the light of fascism shall f shine forth. From the highest peaks of governance under the commons below, the Stuarts had another unexpected benefit for government, and not only is it for the control of the BPP fully re-established, but the authority of even our own old guards reinforced like never before. Already the pragmatists have faced a defeat, and the ideologues have withdrawn two of their bills from Parliament entirely. Butler and Fontaine are quite naturally livid, but with the Lord Portsmouth heading the reinvigorated core of our government with them with a fresh display of strength, we can rest easy knowing that the foundations on which the BPP stand remain solid and steady. Early warnings. Meteorology was rarely a rewarding career. David's father told him that this when he decided to study Liverpool. He said that some other science would be more rewarding in those talents and deserved better, yet David had his passions and he graduated all the same. Two years on, with much less hair and much more bitterness, he often wondered if his father was right. Even without the added stresses of the German invasion that had put almost David out of a job because of employment guidelines, the career was a thankless, joyless one. And on top of all that, Funds have been extremely limited. David's two decades of work were unremarkable. None of the groundbreaking discoveries he had set out to make all those years ago, just largely uninteresting weather reports. 
As he pulled up to the office in his cheap car, there was no reason to think today would be any different from the myriad others he had spent wasting away here. And yet, even as he looked through the recent data, his brow began to furrow severely. Grim patterns were emerging in forecasted weather for the next year. More and more winds blowing from the east, lower temperatures, the lot. All these scattered reports that led him to one dark conclusion. A truly awful winter was coming to Britain, one the country hadn't seen in a century. He frantically went to work, writing a report that detailed the worsening weather alongside the measures that could be put in place to avert disaster. As he went to post the letter, he could only hope that the men in Downing Street would take his warnings to heed. In London, the paper was received swiftly and placed in a ministerial box. It was quickly forgotten, just another warning of doom quickly to be forgotten. Yeah. What to do with Wilson? <clears throat> I've read this one before, so actually I've read this, read both of these. If you want to read about a sequel, Jordan, please go right ahead. But uh, we know this one. If you want to read about what to do with Wilson, please go right ahead as well. Uh, let's keep him muzzled. There you go. And there goes Lobster Wars. All tomorrow's parties. If you want to read this one, please go ahead as well. And then uh, PPP Conference in 1962. As well as a fiscal report, too. Ache for purpose. Uh, I've read this one before, too. If you want to put this, read this one, too, for ache for purpose, please go to heads, too. Bean's experiment. So we'll have to go with Bean. Observing a Colossus, huh? Speaking of the unions. Yeah. Oncoming storm. Um, I think I read this one too, so... But, you know what, we'll read it again, just because it involved Fountain. It was late in the evening that the cabinet of the UK was called in for an emergency meeting by the Prime Minister. All who could attend were quickly rushing through London's chilly streets to Downing Street, where Donville anxiously awaited them, tormented by the knowledge of what was to come. To put it plainly, gentlemen, we're about to face the worst winter since the days of George II, said Donville. I believe that most of the cabinet have been able to come, Fountain and Butler among them. But projections show that if... <clears throat> uh, we fail to act, hundreds of could die of the cold as our energy grid is strained to a breaking point. In a worst case scenario, those villages could freeze to death as the heating falls. We need to move quickly and mobilize the workers to increase energy output, suggested Fontaine, drawing approval from many of those assembled. Without proper motivation, our miners should be able to temporarily increase their coal reserves enough that we can meet the increased demand. For once I agree with you, Andrew, said Butler, surprising his rival. However, we should look to see if our German friends can help us through that crisis as well. We are in a unity pact, after all. They can't exactly refuse to help an ally in need. Over the next few hours, an emergency response plan was drawn up and sent out to the relevant ministries to implement as a priority. While pleased to see the cabinet working together for once, Dombo knew this was only the beginning of what was needed to counteract the potential crisis before it became a real one. There was something else, though, something that unsettled him as he lay in bed that night. Was this merely a bad start to the year, or a sign of things to come? Britain needs a doctor more than ever, in which, even if we tried, we would not be able to get this done at all. So, thanks for the points. Right now, I threw more onto the civvies here. So we're 20%, which is nice. Uh, we need more ideologues for German corporations. But I don't want any more debt. But I know fair, fair. Lord Portsmouth, the Duke of Bedford, and Arthur Chesterton marched away to the House of Lords. Gates, after the lobby was called to be cleared. Bedford and Wallop taking talk the usual smack talk about their lives, leaving Chesterton X out to the right. However, Chesterton saw a certain light in Wallop's eye, which piqued his interest. Oh, Gerard, did you have something interesting for later, perhaps? I haven't seen that look in your face or in your eyes for a while. Also, if you're about Matilda about Jerusalem, please go ahead, too. Wallop would completely block Chesterton out of his mind from now. After officially leaving the gates, Wallop would quickly look around and bring the two sides to, to the side of the corridor. We soon addressed the two. Gentlemen, all right. I'm sure both of you know that I will host the workshop tonight. However, in preparation for tonight's event, I need both of your help. Chesterton finally got his words in, although different from what had previously crossed his mind. Gerard, I would be glad to help you in whatever cause you serve, especially for the workshops, but I am unsure. What would be different than before? Well, I turned his head back and forth, watching the others around the three to check that they weren't being listened to. I hope that, that both of you listen very carefully, because I will not say it again. I need your help, especially in the regards to reaching out to the Lords, especially the importance of English soil and characters to hold true. Bedford would bring himself to speak up. Arthur, as much as it may cut into your time today, you have to help us out. It is vital that we bring everyone here together. Walla patted Bedford's uh, uh, back in affirmation. Exactly, Hastings. As tonight is a major day for the British people, we must help bring the Lords closer to the people. It's up to you to do so. Uh, I I will not join you as not only do I have to prepare for tonight, but also to deal with the Prime Minister. I hope you two are capable of such a task. Get right to it. 
Hmm. Oh, I'll get right to it. What? Screw it, why not? Loose lips, sinks ships. I don't need a few bodies to count, huh? You don't need this, please go ahead. January 63, huh? Hey, inflation's looking better, though. Nothing bad's gonna happen this year. I, I, I can feel it, right? Got a lot of the party, though. I'm gonna do that one, that's fine. You can have more coffee, why not? How can you protect your community from coal hoarding? There's a public service broadcast regarding the practice of coal hoarding and what you can do to stop it in your community. Observe in the graph to your right the average recorded winter temperatures in Britain from the year 1800 to present. Uh, temperatures such as the current years can lead to rapid hypothermia if not insulated, which unless dealt with prop promptly will lead to a slurred speech, confusion, organ failure, and unconsciousness followed by death. Hypothermia occurs when the body loses the heat it needs to regulate itself and is caused by prolonged exposure to extremely cold temperatures. To prevent hypothermia in your community, it's critical that your community maintain its local supply of government-issued coal and that your family obtains its regular rations issued by your community's uh, local council. To ensure a steady supply of your uh, government coal for all families, citizens are advised to keep watch for coal hoarders. What's a coal hoarder? A coal hoarder is an individual in your community who, by theft or bribery, attempts to sell us a coal not assigned to them either for themselves or to provide a terror cells operating in cold locations. Coal hoarders. And coal thieves operate by taking coal from the community directly and can be conclusively traced back to the decrease of coal rations in several communities. What can you do to stop coal hoarders? Coal hoarders should not be confronted directly as a number of them have been linked to terrorist activity. To keep your community safe, you can do the following. 1. Report homes heated in regions deemed non-critical by the government. If there are homes in your neighborhood heated despite non-critical conditions, it's likely that the homes are being heated with stolen coal. 2. They can only a lot of ration of coal. Coal theft is a criminal offense. I'll be met with the harshest legal penalties. Uh, report 3. Report suspected coal hoarders to your local law enforcement or constable. Only with your help can they can identify coal hoarders and stop them from hurting your community. Only you can uh, keep your community safe uh, from coal theft. Falling short. If you're only about falling short, please go ahead. This is about the budget uh, for 1962. You know, things happen. It's alright. They will build Jerusalem. Would be an error? So if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Whoever this before, too. There you go. And the fiscal board. If you want to do that one, please go ahead, too. Ooh. Pop. Boom. And then Bean's experiment. <coughs> Perhaps the most revolting of socialist great lies of fascism is that fascists do not care for the worker. We see the workers only as cogs in the machine left to fuel the bourgeoisie's industry. This cannot be further from the truth, for it is the socialists who act as a mask for the Judeo Bolsheviks who act as defenders of the corrupting influence. For all too long, we've been content to allow the pre-war status of unions remain unchanged, allowing for unions to remain breeding grounds for the resistance, which allow us no longer. With the Beans proposal, we shall nationalize unions and ensure the loyalty to the British state once more, of course. Because why would we not? If you want to read about greasing gears, please go right ahead. As well as the 1963 budget statement, please, if you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead too. More growth. Inflation gets better, increased GDP, more production units. What's not to love, you know? Beans experiment. Oh, if you want to be this fiscal report from last year, too, that'd be great. There you go. That concludes the report. Observing a Colossus, since the end of the Second World War, a new generation of fascists, inspired <clears throat> by the successes and failures of our government, have emerged, many of which now make up the backbone of the ideologues. John Bean is one of the most prominent of these fascists and has proposed a new law to attempt to further reshape Britain. The, this law, based around wiping clean the old corrupt resistance infested unions and replacing them with national syndicates, is immensely popular among ideologues. Though Butler has warned that this would inflame our already dwindling support with union members, this act is necessary to continue British path or Britain's path to a truly fascist nation. Germania's finest, huh? Jonathan could feel a bullet scraping the concrete next to him. He could have taken a defensive position in an old bunker turned base of the resistance, and the fascists were out the door. Uh, he fired a shot, only to be answered by ten more, each one getting closer like the footsteps of a pursuing predator. 
These were not the king's soldiers of some government militia informed at the last minute. These look more like German invaders, the one who had taken everything he ever loved from 20 year, about 20 years ago. Yet the Union Jack patch on the uniform signified something other, something perhaps worse. They were the British Free Corps, an extension of Germany's hand on the Isles, and staffed by the worst traitors and fascists Britain could offer. Jonathan heard the rumors about them, the government forces struggling to keep things in order, but the BFC came and all was done in a day, leaving nothing but bullet holes and smoke. Fork even turned and pleaded with the captain for an attempt at retreat and escape. An explosion ripped through the complex. He spun around, baffled about where it had come from. Maybe the fascist poison had seeped even deeper in the deepest part of the resistance. He wouldn't have time to take those thoughts any further as out of the smoke and fire, a man in coat and no helmet emerged, quickly approaching him. Flanked by four other men, his face was twisted into a seemingly permanent smirk. Oblivious of the corpse lining the hall, Jonathan struggled to get up, only just noticing his legs had been buried in the fallen concrete of the ceiling. He gave a hunch as the man in the dark coat approached him, a flash of confidence and disgust in his eyes. Screw you, you fascist. Uh, his sentence was cut short by a single shot to the head. All right, man, Thomas, Thomas Holler, Cooper shouted. Clear the theory of any vermin or traitors, come you find me, take whatever you like. Today's a victory for us and all Britain. We have much work to do, of course. Just trying to make Britain a better place. Fascism is the way to go, my friends. But happy March, everybody. Happy, happy March. Now, I won't, like I said, I won't show you every. Well, maybe I haven't said it, but I won't show you exactly every single little detail because I've done it before in my route when I went with Rab Butler. So a lot of the stuff I've read before, obviously the ones we're doing right now, generally the ones we've not done or have seen or worked on or whatever. But we're getting there because we got to absorb a Colossus and do the military stuff and then we'll have the Civil War. But tea with Mr. Bean. Now, can we immediately root socialism from the minds of these workers? No, but what can we can do, Barry Donville nodded blankly as John Bean continued his spiel. In the brief time he knew him, Donville did that said Bean was a f funny little man. Fontaine suggested that he'd heard his ideas out of their last briefing, and frankly, Donville could see why the ideologue was so fond of Bean. Sitting across from him, the man babbled at a mile a minute, producing paper after paper extolling the virtues of nationalistic trade unions. If such a thing were even possible, Donville was unsure. The Prime Minister had upheld his hands, signaling for Bean to momentarily quiet himself. So then, if I mean to understand all this correctly, you're proposing that we nationalize the unions? Be not a yes, he said, as if it were the simplest thing in the world. Donville's eyebrows raised sharply, but as I've said, these won't be the cowardly selfish unions we know today. No, these will be by patriotic collectors of workers who shall work towards the common goal of the nation. Uh, being explained, the grievances shall be honest and the needs shall be few. After all, what better way to defeat Judeo-Bolshevism than to purify its ideals? B went on for a few more minutes before Donville found himself unable to take any more. Mr. Bean, your ideas shall be considered. Thank you for your time. Bean's eyes lit up with glee, and he thanked the Prime Minister profusely for leaving his office, and as soon as the door shut, Donville sighed heavily. This was Fontaine's best man. He would have made an excellent rider, certainly, but governing was more than a manifesto, and yet Fontaine trusted him. That man knew that was what was good for Britain, and he believed in Bean, then Donville supposed he had to as well. Hopefully we'd be more succinct next time. Good. Good. Decent, decent, decent. Decent all around. We have Greasing Gears, we have that. Ultimals Parties. Comps can now begin. We'll probably leave that for the last. Well, there's not much else we need here. Uh, we're going to have to support, uh, support force of the garrison, though. Despite what some amongst us may wish, as galling as it is to admit it, the real military power in the Isles lies with the German garrison. What's left of the British Army is but a handful of recruits and equipment, and frankly, it's more trouble than it's worth. The most efficient move would be to give control of what's left of the army to the Germans, supporting the garrison and its ventures. While some may perceive such a move as tethering the country even further to the Reich, the wise among us recognize that it would be a surefire way to ingratiate ourselves even further to the German benefactors. And with their aid is something we cannot afford to let slip. With the military might of our twin regimes combined, Britain and Germany shall surely last a thousand years. The proper sort. If you wonder about this one, please go ahead. I've read this one before. Like Nero once fiddled his Rome burned, but instead toasted. Carrot and stick. So you see, gentlemen, draw John Bean to the Simple Union, men sitting around the conference room. The arrangement is really a sim very simple one. Your union shall be organized as one in a way better suited to the suit of the national interests. <clears throat> Um, and collective aims of all good Britons. The five men glowering back at him were clearly uncomfortable, sitting in their ill-filled suits. Bean felt almost unsympathetic. A working man had a way of filling out the place, sitting in the high government offices. He would know what better than anyone else. Also, if you want to about white blankets, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Their leader didn't share his empathy. We've heard your arrangement, Mr. Bean, and we're going to be straight with you because you've been straight with us. It's stupid. We don't like it or people won't like it. You want to end strikes? This isn't the way. A series of mutters from his companions showed that the sentiment wasn't unanimous. My offer is generous, insisted Beam, flicking a third off a suit. You and your associates will remain and retain positions in this reorganization. The only changes will be around the creation of new positions to streamline national organization and further regulations around anti-British agitation. Something no good British Union will be engaged in either way. 
Another one of those bosses, scouts jabbing, jabbing finger at him. Now look here, Bean. You can call it what you want, but we know what this is. You keep this up. People could get, let's say, demotivated. The boss is telling me the threat clear. Bean snorted. I'll strike you, Meme. Oh, well, yes, you could do that. I'd be quite in a bit of trouble. But so would you, once Downward Ben's call wins. So here's my offer again, Mr. Fredericks. Work with me or take your chances challenging them. Grumbling the gradually ascended. Yes, the union bosses got up to leave. One of them returned to him. I know you think you're clever, but don't think you put out a fire here. Could be that you just poured gas on it. Yeah. You think about that. The boss walked out the door, ignored by beans outside a scoff of disdain. Nice. Looking pretty decent. And they're blowing each other up there. Which is nice. Both thrust. As the government relies on a great German allies for def defense, and looks at the garrison more and more, Rudolf Wolf has grown more and more confident in our eternal faith in his abilities. Our alliance with the Germans will look after our lands while we focus on more important issues has led to Wolf's presence in the cabinet meetings to grow more and more typical. His influence offers us a major advantage as Wolf sees our defense plans hinge more and more on him. His trust in the government can only skyrocket, allowing for more trustworthy German garrison, meaning not only more security than the Rome, but in our own government. Um, with such grand friends within the German army, what does our government have to fear? I have already read about the life the price of collaboration, please go right ahead. The blood soaked cost of collaboration. Say love you. Ah, fascism. We have two fascism. Very cool. You can have one fascism. Well, imagine if you had two. They're both that failed. Nice job, Argentina. Happy May, everybody. Good old Borkuta. Give them free reign in the countryside. As the garrison takes control of more and more of their defenses, we must not turn to allow them to move against the resistance once more. To test the validity of their methods, we shall avoid unnecessary casualties. We first shall test them in the countryside, where McLean's merry man lie in wait preparing for the foolish revolution. We must now put our utmost faith in them and allow them to do anything they can, even if it be unsavory and brutal. Methods to finally root out the resistance and more and restore stability to the British Isles, of course. You gotta do what you gotta do, man. But now the hunters hunted. Hans could feel the rainwater seeping into his boots as they marched through the well winding streets of Liverpool. They had been dispatched by the garrison to root out our, mm, the jail, jail Bolshevik partisans they had heard were hiding near the city's docks. This would be a glorious victory for the fatherland and for our friends of Britain, yet the young man could not help but be filled with dread as they approached the docks under the cover of darkness. The men next to him were clearly bothered as well, glancing from side to side at every minor noise. Something was wrong, they consented. All of a sudden, their commanding officer held up his hand. Sh uh, Schnell, he whispered harshly, commanding his forces to stop. For a moment, it was still. Schnell, doesn't he still mean fast? Or maybe fast stop, maybe man. And then from the shadows, a Zidane of cocktail came flying, killing at least four men. As if they had been hiding in the dingy street itself, several armed men, bedecked with various weapons and clothing painted with communist symbols, emerged, living upon the German force like a Venus flytrap. The sounds of gunfire filled the night as the discombobulated Germans desperately tried to fight back. Hans could only watch as his comrades were beaten, knocked out, and gunned down in front of him. This wasn't supposed to be how that night went. They were the German army, the greatest military force in the world, the heroes of the Aryan race that were destined for greatness. And here they were being slaughtered like pigs by mere partisans. He had to leave. He needed to report back to the garrison so they could arrive with the reinforcements. Desperately trying to ignore the cries of his fellow soldiers as they screamed for help, Hans ran back to the direction that they came. But before his mind could muster anything other than senseless fear, a sharp splitting pain traveled through his head, knocking the soldier to the floor. And where do you think you're going, eh, lad? A uh, voice shouted at him from above, fuzzily. Hans could make out the outline of a well built man who was holding a large blunt pipe. His vision cleared somewhat, and suddenly could he make the figure out. It was Jack Jones, the leader of the left resistance. The man crouched down and looked at the soldier in the eyes. I'm not sure how much English you speak, but I'm going to keep it simple. I've been fighting fast dudes like you before Germans, before you Germans even entered Britain. We fought you, and we'll fight you again. You lot are done, and with that, he brought down the pipe on Hans' head, turning it dark. And then in that hardest jack, we could keep down the proletariat. For now. I don't want to play with Russia again. Russia's fun to play as. Hey, 40% is not bad. It's good. Inflation's going down. Things are looking up for us. I read this one last time. Focus on urban areas. While the med bomber Fitzroy McLean may pose a sizable challenge to a government, he's a lesser threat of the terrible twins, for whilst McLean's methods result in empirical destruction, the poison spread by Jack Jones and the UFLR is far more insidious. Jones and his lot, like the rats they are, carry the plague of socialism with them. It breeds within the urban areas, infesting the minds of good British men and women, and turning them against their fatherland. If we let this rock go unattended, then it shall soon spill out of the cities and engulf the entire nation. With the help of our German comrades, we should rather this tent wherever we might find it and exterminate it for the good of all of us. The hunters hunted. 
You do what you must. Of course, if you want to read about the search for the terrible twins, drag Zomp, his good head. There's all the stuff that we know before the conference as well. And of course, Uptick's connectivity. And we'll actually talk about the conference and then do Uptick's connectivity when we get there. And Germania's fine as so. well. Nice job, Nixon. That's what we like to see. Very good, very good, very good. Oh, we need some more motorized, huh? It's pretty normal. You have early, a few hel early helicopters, pretty cool. Burgundy, Ukraine is uh, not looking so good, are they? Jord Librant, Librant. Develop the Brautagum. Brautagum, the melt of rot. Good God. Walk the eggshells. The rot grows within. Put yourself on the line. When Bud told his mother of his intentions. Oh, I read this one before. If you want to do this one, please go ahead as well. Yeah. And then, uh, on the line. Rob Butler, original modeling. Liberal conservatism, huh? Filthy. Happy uh, July, though. It's not bad for this one, anyways, too. So, I want to make sure we have a majority and everything. No one get influence posts? What about Germany, Germania's finest? Is that bugged or something? Or maybe the that event that we got fired, but it was the wrong event that fired. Bash production, anything else here? Nope. They search for the terrible twins. They can't keep getting away with it. But somehow they do. Do we not have any other event about this? Well, what kind of suck if we didn't? Quite strange, I would say. The natural evolution. When the British People's Party was founded, it was not merely a new party, but a political revolution in Britain. The pain was immeasurable, and the cost was great, but the British people were a resilient folk. Out of the ashes of the old order would come to a Britain and renewed and reinvigorated and looking towards the future. It was that revolution that is honored in the celebration. Fontaine speaks to a deafening support as Butler quietly sags. His eyes full of jealousy and resentment. But the revolution won out over the tired old man. That was a natural revolution. Why did Butler even think he could make a message of returning to the old ways, old days, when it was so evident, clearly evident, that it was no longer 1900? No, the people would want a revolution, and the revolution is what Fontaine would give them. One need only to take a look at the world to see why the people would support it. The nations that clung to tired liberalism found themselves conquered while on the back foot of an unstable mess. The fascists that these last decades have had the fascist world faced with the constant challenges, and yet the world order was undoubtedly that of the new order. The Germans, Italians, and Japanese had done within decades what Marxists could not achieve in centuries. The choice was obvious and simple as could be. Fontaine spoke with finality and pride. The past century has been hard on every one of us. It was not the end of us. <clears throat> and we survived. We were about to purge the weakness of our society. I thank you all and swear to Britain, every British man the best is yet to come. The corrupt den. Uh, snakes and reformists could only look on as the room applauded. The revolutionary spirit that birthed the party continues to burn brightly. As it should. We're looking decent here. Happy October. Nothing bad will ever happen in this month. Nothing bad whatsoever. As we have a few optics in activity, but you know, it is what it is. I'm very down, but nothing bad is going to happen. Oh, I also did this too, but... Uh, Memorial of a Tyrant. If you're about this, please go right ahead. Ding dong. Germanian chaos. Mobilizing this. Um, declare support of Hitler's successor. So I've read through all these before. So if you don't know about these, please go ahead. A lot of this is not going to really affect us too much, in all honesty. Uh, so if there's something that's very uh, important for <clears throat> us trying to get Fontaine. I will probably show you and read it to you, but um, honestly, there's not really much here specifically that's Fontaine. And even Fontaine doesn't have a ton of content. It is merely what it basically what it'll look like eventually. That's on the streets, keeping a tidy eye on Jordan's ilk. Decent Glasgow and Balkan Wartime Act, of course. Uh, arrest on their leaders. Alaska location. The terrible two captured. Yeah. 
And then, of course, weathering the storm. And here we are. There goes my voice cracking again. The Civil War is raging, and we're doing pretty well at this point. <coughs> it's April 16th, 1964. We could be doing a lot worse. We've got most of England under control. We need, we're trying to get Wales back. We've got Cornwall under us. And Scotland is going to be a problem, but the Panzer shall halt. I didn't deny that we're on the back foot of this conflict, and yet the same can be said for the rebels. And while there are many, we are the nation, and we are more than a ragtag group of jumped-up partisans. We have access to resources and support far greater than our enemies have because we possess this advantage. However fleeting as it may be, it's important that we don't waste it. The tanks and our heavy artillery will be shelled for now until we either start winning or, God forbid, things get truly desperate or a simpler solution. Most problems we face in the world of devastating simple solutions is a waste of time to overthink a problem when such a simple answer lies right in front of us. Once Germany faces the exact same crisis we do, their workforce outfighting in Russia and Western Europe and thus unable to produce the arms necessary for war. How did they solve this? By putting the military prisoners in undesirable work, and well, it worked. The German economy outproduced us and were swiftly conquered by the well-trained, well-equipped military. <coughs> now I must learn from the success and use our own prisoners to fill our labor gap. Whilst we may have moral considerations over such a solution, it will be a method proven to work. To save Britain, we must use all means at our disposal to win. Maybe about simplification, please go ahead, as well as... Uh, quality checks as well, or BSA quality checks, but the fighters as well. As upsetting as it is to admit, this isn't going to be a conflict that we can win using the Royal Air Force if we want our own people to side with us. Going around bombing our own country like it's a petty warlord in West Russia is something we absolutely cannot afford to do yet for now. We need to lock the planes away so the rebels cannot access them. Who knows, perhaps we'll find some use for them as the fight rages on. Cool. Never yeah, we lost the Isle of Man, but whatever. At this point, we have to take out Cardiff. And swing around here and uh, take out Liverpool. You can help out here. No matter what it takes. Because I'm going to throw the arm here too. Oh, the wrong outcome. When Charles Morris joined the resistance, he expected glory. A struggle against an evil regime to restore his beloved nation back to the rightful rule of its own people. He expected toil, hardship, and pain, perhaps even death itself. But, and if he were to die, he'd do so gladly, for there could be no greater idea to give one's life for, um, for freedom. But the collaborators were not kind enough to give him such a fate. Instead, they... <clears throat> Consigned to work in a crap old factory in the middle of London, uh, making the bullets that would be used by the sniveling twats a popular regime's army to gun down his comrades. Uh, into every hateful little sh uh, shell he was forced to make under the pain of death. He liked to think he channeled some of his own spite. Perhaps a gun they'd loaded into would backfire, turning on its user only one could hope. Part Charlie wanted to get things over with and die anyway, to throw himself at some of the worthless jackboots who made sure none of the other penal workers escaped and go out into a blaze of glory. Part of him wished that the enemy had at least had the decency to gun him down with his friends rather than to force him onwards like this. But whenever these thoughts bubbled to the top, Charlie forced himself to think to this dear old mom and how she'd need him when the war was over. <clears throat> so stealing himself, Charlie would continue working, with only the image of his mother and the silent hope that all of the guards would spontaneously keel over and die keeping him going. What else does a man have? <coughs> ah, good. The goal is to encircle and destroy here at this point. Very good. Fighters as well. And Cornwall secure. We're going about Cornwall. Please go ahead once we get this loaded, of course. Because God knows we need, we do need stability here. Good. Going well secured, and then cruise on auxiliary. If there be one thing we can confidently claim to not be in short supply of this winter, it's those delightful characters that piloted the Panzers. As you know, we're done in men of superior engineering, quality and equipment, training, and genetics, found themselves without much to do. We can use our exceptional skills and roles that we desperately need filling military police, AA, and other auxiliary roles. Nothing too demeaning, of course. We do need vote to agree, after all, and be hardly to do have his precious air and soldiers doing the grunt work. And if you want to read about through a lens, please go ahead as well. Flash. Money is money, my friends. Money is, of course, money. Honorary constables. That should be done by now. Come on, do better. This utterly horse crap, proclaimed Gunther, uh, kicking over a discarded car and in frustration, attracting the startled attention of the two policemen in the road checkpoint with them. Having spotted, snorted in response, lazily stretching his arms before letting out a satisfied groan. 
Uh, you're still complaining? Come on, would you rather be up there cleaning up the rabble? Joseph says the dudes have American a AT launchers. So what about Gunther moodily? They still lost. I joined the head to defend the Reich, not in certain checkpoints with British policemen and check papers. I can barely read half this crap as it is. Come on, read this. What does it even say? He thrust it a folder, Herman, who took it with a shrug. All in English. It may out a couple words, but nothing specific. No idea. Why don't you try asking them? He pointed at the two increasingly confused and slowly became agitated policemen in the checkpoint with them. It's well, uh, the soldier shook his head. Uh, I don't care enough. It's probably just some arrest report. That's not fair, Herman. I fought the Russians in the east. I pushed these English out of Wales, and what's the things I get? Guard duty of these civilians? He gestured wildly at the two policemen who were openly glowering now. He took a deep swig from his water flask, passing it back to him and who let out a chuckle. A chuckle. You know, going to, you complain an awful lot for someone who's paid to sit around. If you're about the free court question, please go to two. <clears throat> and, uh, scrap planes for aluminum. All right, to heck with it. We can do without the planes. It wasn't like we were going to make much use of them anyways. Right now, we have more pressing matters to worry about. More pressing matters that we can use or recycle airplane parts to solve. I'll scrap them, smash them, cannibalize them. We need. We will have time for an Air Force and pieces of dinner store to Britain. And they're still trying to fight us up here too, which is awful, whatever. I'm not so concerned about this area as I am down here. You've got to force the attack. There you go. Fine, thank God. Jesus Christ. Now we're going to destroy 11 divisions here. Are we on track this winter? We've done it all we can in regards to fuel situation, cutting costs, uh, stripping vehicles bare, scrounging for oil like a man in the desert would with, with water. Truly, this is a new low point. Nonetheless, the census we've taken under fuel supplies shows us that we have enough oil to survive the ensuing carnage, and with a military machine that is still running, it's only by hair. All that's left to do is to fight on and hope that what little fuel we eked out won't run out. We can only pay for so much. Jonathan was not the type of man who to name his plane or to generally caress and speak to it. No, that was loony behavior and unprecedented professional to boot. What he did do, however, was make sure that each plane was shined, every bolt tight, and every working part of this ancient engine still cranked on when he needed it too. He spent so many hours on the darn plane, time he really should have spent with his wife and children. It was no surprise when he came home one day to find a note in an empty house. He pushed the thought out of his head. This country needed him. The Bolshevik accords were descending, and they would need him up in the sky, blowing them up from below. He shut himself before entering the hangar. It was quietly, quickly filled with horror as he saw his beloved plane being taken apart by a crew of men. What the do you think you're doing? He shouted at the man who was obviously in charge, who didn't seem phased. Apologies, sir, but the Air Force is somewhat bloated at the moment. We can't keep too many men up in the air who should be on the ground. Your plane has been deemed sufficiently old and scrappable enough to be... But I'm the bloody best pilot in the entire base, he interjected. The man said, I'll be frank with you, he said. They can't pay for anything. No ammo, no fuel, none of it. People at the top are reckoning that the insurgents don't have many plans, so what's the use in having them up there? That makes sense. Far too much sense, but before I can say anything else, the man, the man continued. But do not worry, you can still do your bit. You're expected at the local military base, and he checked his watch, eyes widening slightly. Half an hour, better get going. One more body. As men are now rushing to help out in the Scottish Highlands. This part is unacceptable. You will have to do your part here. There you go. So we did our Revolt Extremists last time. It was when we played as Rob Butler. But we'll do our applicable rivals. Let's face it, the BFC is utterly deranged. A lot of them are going to be unabashedly psychotic, ruthless gowlers. They'll be happy to throw a rule to the wind in favor of their own bloody regime. But they're unabashedly psychotic, ruthless gowlers who are on our side. We can't afford to let Jordan and his men go too far without supervision, obviously. But men in arms are what needs to function efficiently. It only makes sense to give them what they want. Give them some Get a little guys uh, regroup first. We've only lost 100,000. They've lost over half a million. The push shouldn't be too hard into them, but you never know. Give us a little bit more time here. No magic capabilities, it's pretty normal. Jordan's murders. You must be mad, Butler yelled, uncharacteristically agitated. The order dragged on far too long, and in haste, Neil Kane called an emergency cabinet meeting. Manpower was running low, and thus a decision had to be made in regards to the role the BFC would play in the war. Naturally, Butler was a little enthusiastic about it. They're lunatics. Mad dogs would kill more on their side than they'll resistance. There won't be a Briton to govern by the time they're through with it, he ranted, pacing around the room. So of the ministers not in tandem. The British Free Corps is certainly not a popular bunch, even among the fascisti. Oh, and as I'm on cue, Fontaine spoke up. Well, then we'll change. Spread the members out thinly. Only allow one BFC regiment for every five non-BFC regiments. 
generally acquiesce if we give him more guns, so we may as well get him out of the way. Well, there's incense, gopping at fountain, so you give him the tools they need to rain terror on people then? He scoffed, leering at Butler. No, we throw them at the most well-defended areas. That way it's a minimal loss on value on our end. The two men continue to argue back and forth while Nal Kane sank into his thoughts. <coughs> Excuse me, no one liked the BFC. But times were desperate. If the generals had not been so subtly pressuring him to giving Jordan what he wanted for ages, could he truly afford not to? Sighing, Nal Kane made his decision. We don't work with the front line frothing lunatics. Jordan can get stuffed. <coughs> but we'll see. Uh, so we can do that one. If you want to read about how long last winter has passed, that'd be good to have eventually. That'll be fantastic. It shall be. So, the Civil War has been won. Really not that difficult. Um, there's our economy right now, too. We have a giant deficit. I did do uh, temporary tax hikes, but it is what it is. Uh, as we're rounding out this episode, uh, the, uh, to get true to form, fascism as an ideology has been beneficial to all powers willing and unfortunately pressured to work under its watchful eye. The reason why I succeeded at Liberate Africa, Europe, and Asia, and that's because the core tenets of the movement keep nations strong and prosperous. There's also the reason why it's all here as well. The British People's Party was formally upsaved Britannia from the regime of Chamberlain and Churchill. However, our political forefathers failed to save the nation, eventually landing the people into this mess. The true links of fascism were never tried, but now that we have the potential to fix that. Which would be good. A hand in embracing. There are many across Britain who see the light of fascism, but are merely forced into the farce of opposing us. We show our hand in the true power of British fascism. Many of them see the light. We may need to beat down a few members of the opposition, but fascism requires sacrifice. Britain lives and marches on, and for that, we will fight on. It shall triumph. The triumph of fascism over the decadent liberal dem democracies and Judeo-Bolshevik bastions has shown the path for Britain's future. Long as our island remains chained to the whims of four foreign masters, where our overlord sought us by force, we will make it aware by our own destiny through their guidance. Only through the strength of will can our glorious nation rise from the ashes of the past failures. Where Hitler showed us the way, we must now follow, of course. Any martial law. The last year has been in short of a pile of crap for everyone involved. Families have been torn apart, brothers turned upon brother, lives have been overturned, and we were left to pick up the pieces. One thing that can take solace in, however, is that the fact that the resistance is finally well and truly crushed. And for the better or for worse, Britain's future has been decided. Well, the shot house of buildings were replaced with new ones, and people began to once again walk the streets without fear of getting bombed. We can say that life has slowly but surely returned to normal. The only task remains for us is to give the order to the army to formally enter martial law. Only thank you we finally put the ghosts of the past behind us and continue onwards into the future unimp unimpeded. Safety and security, and so in summary, resistance activities plummeted across Britain thanks to our anti-partisan campaigns, aided by German friends and auxiliaries of the BFC. We estimate the vast majority of Himmler members are now dead or fled the country, and their sympathizers are either in prison or scared into total, total submission. Fontaine finished his report to Nal Kane with no small amount of pride, a grin spreading across his face as he saw the Prime Minister was equally impressed. This is darn fine work, Fontaine. Darn fine indeed, Nal Kane replied, leafing through the folder containing the written report. Pleased to see that Fontaine's words did not exaggerate the success of the operations, of course. You would never see the few pages Fontaine had removed from it, and the true cost of anti-partisan activities buried forever alongside other innocent victims. Eh. I must also add, Prime Minister, that these results are by no means concrete yet. We require further enhanced security apparatus and continue operations to root out the last traitors and prevent their, our, their return. I, I and many within the party are in agreement on this, but I fear that some of our colleagues are too hesitant to strike the killing blow required, Fontaine added in an not so subtle jab at his rival. No, Kane, not in agreement, sighing as he closed the folder. I share your concerns, Butler and his lot mean well, and he's a darn fine chancellor, but I do worry about some of his security proposals. He's far too soft on the terrorists. Seeing the window of opportunity wide open, Fontaine leaped into it. Prime Minister. As long as I remain a member of this government, I will not allow Britain to fall to Judeo-Bolshevik insurgents. You can count on us to keep the nation safe and secure. Nal Kane's nod spoke louder than any endorsement, and Fontaine secured a new edge in the race for number 10. Security. At. Any. Costs. They're looking pretty good overall. Uh, credit rating's not great, but we're ending martial law, and we have overcome. It looks like a lot of Europe has overcome to... Whoa! Ukraine is looking mighty thick here against Poland. What's going on here? Why do they... Why do they have Lviv, Lvau... Transnistria govern it. Well, Romania's looking pretty thick too. Oh my god, it's actually a war. Can't wait to see what they're like. We've overcome. Um, let's see. Hey, if you wonder about this one, please go ahead. They have an arrow. No place for kings. Your Majesty, it is my most heartfelt desire that you allow me to form a government. As you know, the party's behind me fully, and any government of mine will make certain to respect the monarchy and all its rights. So Fontaine said, but Edward was decidedly certain that he was being dishonest. He knew full well of Fontaine's rhetoric regarding the old aristocracy's influence of politics, and he saw no reason to believe that it didn't extend the monarchy as well. In addition, the push against the party's old guard and pragmatists deeply concerned him, and was fairly sure that it was a prelude to further power grabs. However, there's little he could do, save for attempt to influence his government into better policies, provided they were even willing to listen. Your Majesty, I must insist on receiving an answer today. Britain is ailing from the war in years of decay beforehand, and we need a strong united government to face it. 
This response jolted Edwards forcibly out of the speculative reverie and was able to respond in kind fairly quickly. Very well, Fontaine. But it must assist your government takes a far less competitive tone regarding the upper class and that you begin to reconcile with the other elements of the party. Of course, Your Majesty, I've never intended to upset the natural order of things of Britain, and the disunity of the party certainly was not my doing. You might word that your wishes will be respected when I'm Prime Minister. Edward nodded and gave his assent to forming a government, but did not have faith in Fontaine's promises at all. He would have to prefer, prefer virtually anyone else to have gained control over the BPP, and he knew that when Fontaine was Prime Minister, he could do nothing against him. Empty promises are readily discarded. His Majesty the King has asked me to form a government, and I've accepted. In the vision of a united Britain, I shall march ahead without hesitation. Andrew Fontaine, appointed Prime Minister. It looks better here than here, but whatever. Following the resignation of the previous Prime Minister, Ronald Nall Kane, second Baron Brockett, the British government has decidedly taken a more revolutionary bent as avowed fascist Andrew Fontaine, as appointed to be his successor. A rising star within the British People's Party, Fontaine rose to prominence as the leader of the revolt which deposed A.K. Chesterton in 1956, the zealous wave of radical ideologue wing now carried him to number 10. Sitting triumphant before number 10, Fontaine declared that he should ignite the fire of fascism in these isles, which would be a beacon for the whole world to follow. Sources claim, however, that a power struggle has already broken up between Fontaine's top advisors, Geoffrey Hamm and John Beam, leaving the nature of the British Revolution yet to be determined. The old grow weak, and the young ate the old. Yum yum, hurrah for the black shirts. At long last, the darkness that has lain over Britain shall be scoured away by the blinding flame of fascism. The fragment of slice shattered around us, their weakness cleared all sea. The old guard is broken, the, wherein, with Donville's uh, folly consigning them to the dustbin of history, the any of Britain's dawning and Andrew Fontaine will lead it. We'll report to the sceptered isle, and finish the great task laid down to us from the martyrs who marched before us. From the home counties to the Scottish Highlands, a single phrase will echo as British nation rises up to claim a rightful place in the sun. Britain lives and marches on. Ooh. Lighting the torch. If there's one thing that both Donville's failures and the follower of the uprising taught us, it is that the light of fascism has not yet enveloped the heart of the British people. Luckily, Fontaine knows exactly how to secure the support in our crusade to reforge Britain into a better version of herself. It's a tried and tested tool that's proven successful in bringing many other powers of greatness into the tool is propaganda. And for all the zealots and ideologues across the party, there are a few more motivated and committed to the cause than John Bean. Let's go to Orton Ryder. Bean will tour across the nation and spread a message. The people will know that a few new, glorious future, oh, that will await our country, and that to make it a reality, they need to only step forward and take it. But we're going to end it there and finish this small campaign, short campaign, in the next episode. If you enjoyed the, uh, the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow to see what we can do with the good old Andrew Fountain. Thank you for watching, and have a great rest of your day!